At 23 years old, I became the youngest woman in the country to remove both of my breasts, even though I didn't have breast cancer. At 36 years old, just six months after giving birth to my son, I was again on the operating table, this time removing my ovaries, even though I didn't have ovarian cancer. Why, you may be wondering, would a healthy young woman make such a radical decision, choosing to remove parts of her own body twice? Well, to truly understand the magnitude of my decision, I'd like to introduce you to two pivotal women. This is my grandmother, Sandra, and her mother, my great-grandmother, Lillian. I'm told that they shared an impeccable sense of style and a laugh so vibrant it would light up any room that they walked into. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to meet either of these amazing women as they died a week apart, both from breast cancer, at the young ages of 39 and 58. And this is my mom, Wendy. She had both breast and ovarian cancer before the age of 43. My middle school years were marked by supporting her through dozens of chemo and radiation treatments. Thankfully, she survived, but through it all, one thing became incredibly apparent. Clearly, cancer runs in my family. With this knowledge, I underwent genetic testing and found out that I carried the BRCA1 gene mutation, indicating that I had up to an 87% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer and up to a 54% lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. With odds like these, it truly felt as though it was not a matter of if I would get cancer, but when. And so I made the decision to take bold action. I proactively sought out a surgeon to remove both of my breasts, eliminating nearly every chance I had of getting breast cancer. 13 years later, I again proactively sought out a surgeon, this time to remove my ovaries through a hysterectomy, eliminating nearly every chance I had of getting ovarian cancer. Now, I should note that I can stand here before you today and recount these experiences without falling to pieces, making it all seem easy and effortless, but can I tell you something? I was really, really scared. The surgeries, the recovery, the unknown felt all consuming. I'll never forget bursting into tears the first time I caught a glimpse of my newly reconstructed breasts in the mirror and just thinking to myself, will I always feel this broken? Or the sheer panic that overcame me when I was unable to pick up and comfort my crying newborn son due to some of the post-surgical lifting restrictions from the hysterectomy and just wondering, what kind of mother am I? And yet, I can tell you for certain that I feel extraordinarily fortunate. I was afforded valuable knowledge knowledge of my own genetic makeup, knowledge generations of women before me never had, and with it, the opportunity to take a radically proactive approach with my health. And I'm here today to urge each and every one of you to take a radically proactive approach with your health as well. I know what you must be thinking. Lindsay, are you trying to convince me to start moving parts of my own body? The answer is a clear and resounding no. For me and my situation, the right way to be radically proactive was removing my breasts and ovaries. However, for most people, being radically proactive with their health need not be this extreme, even though it is every bit as important. So how does it work? How would someone go about adopting a radically proactive approach to their health? To break it down, I developed a three-step model. Awareness, assessment, action. I should note that I did not develop this model in a vacuum. After my breast surgery, I started and grew Bright Pink, an award-winning national nonprofit organization that's helped millions of women become more aware of their breast and ovarian health, assess their cancer risk, and put a personalized plan into action. The central framework for Bright Pink has been awareness, assessment, action. And while we know that this framework works in the context of Bright Pink's mission, it has always been my firm belief that this radically proactive approach has the power to reshape the broader health conversation. To introduce you to the model, I'd love to walk through a simple example, likely something you practiced this morning without giving it a second thought, preparing for Chicago weather. First, you practiced awareness. You were each aware that it's April in Chicago and the weather can be unpredictable. Warm one day, freezing the next, often rainy. Then 
you did an assessment. Maybe you opened the window or you checked an app on your phone. And for instance, notice there was a high chance of rain, so you developed a plan. Finally, with the awareness of the unpredictable weather and the assessment of likely rain, you made sure to bring an umbrella and not let the rain get in the way of you living your life. Great job, way to be proactive. Now let's bring it back to our health where, let's be honest, the stakes are far higher than if you were to get a little bit wet. This same model we just walked through in the weather example, awareness, assessment, action, is how each and every one of you can take a radically proactive approach with your health and quite possibly change the trajectory of your life. To make it even more tangible, let's run three common health conditions through our model. The onset of heart disease, the evolution of spots on your skin into malignant skin cancer, the development of alcoholism. We start with awareness. Now, awareness is all about having a deep curiosity for the health risks that exist. It is about prioritizing quality, evidence-based information, and asking lots of questions. When we think about our three health examples, awareness could look like becoming aware that high blood pressure can lead to heart disease, becoming aware that spots on your skin can evolve and become skin cancer, becoming aware that alcoholism can be hereditary and passed down through generations. Without awareness, we really have no basis upon which to make decisions about our health, and we're essentially in the dark. Awareness is our first step. Next, assessment. Now in assessment, we're basically asking ourselves one important question. Of all the health risks that exist out there, which ones specifically apply to me, and what's my plan to address them? Revisiting our same three health examples, assessment could take shape in the following ways. After your doctor shares that your blood pressure was a bit high, you look into ordering a home monitoring device and research the correlation between blood pressure and diet. With the awareness that you have a bunch of moles on your skin, you set a reoccurring calendar reminder on the first of every month to make sure you check in and notice if there's any changes. Knowing that your dad had a drinking problem, you commit to limiting your alcohol intake. Now, I must caveat there's a spectrum here. I'm not telling you to be a hypochondriac. I'm not telling you to live at the doctor's office. And I'm definitely not telling you to chase after every potential health risk that could possibly exist. Assessment is about pinpointing the most relevant health risks you personally face and charting a plan to address them. And with that plan in hand, you're ready for our final step, action. Now the thing about action is it's both the easiest concept for me to explain, yet the hardest to implement because, let's be honest, without the urgency of a diagnosis, taking on additional or uncomfortable steps can feel burdensome and unnecessary. Tending to our health only when there's a problem to solve or issue to fix is far less work, but the consequences can be deadly and dire. That's why action is so, so important. Revisiting our same three health examples, action could look like monitoring your blood pressure at home on a weekly basis and adopting a low sodium diet, getting that mole removed that the doctor deems concerning soon after it's found and not months later, drinking moderately or avoiding alcohol altogether. Awareness is about knowing the health risks that exist. Assessment is about pinpointing the ones that are most relevant to you in developing a plan. Action is about making that plan happen. Awareness, assessment, action, that is radical proactivity. Now, if a handful of you left this conversation and adopted a radically proactive approach with your health, I'd be thrilled. However, just for one moment, I'd like to invite us to consider the collective impact if millions of people adopted a radically proactive approach to their health. Think about the healthcare costs that could be repurposed. Think about the late stage diagnoses that could be avoided. Think about the lives that could be saved. So far, you've had the opportunity to meet four generations of women in my family. My great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother and me. I'd love to close by introducing you to the fifth generation. This is my five-year-old daughter, Lucy. My husband, Greg, and I conceived Lucy using IVF 
in an innovative procedure called PGD, which essentially screened our embryos for ones which did not carry the BRCA1 gene mutation. Lucy was born nine months later, healthy, beautiful, and without a significant predisposition to developing breast and ovarian cancer. Because of this, Lucy will not have to live through so many of the heart-wrenching experiences that generations of women before her have had to. When I look at my sweet girl, I'm filled with gratitude, solace, and honestly awe at the better and brighter future that will be afforded to her and subsequent generations of women in my family, all made possible by radical proactivity. Thank you.